Hello my dears, and welcome back to another video. Um, I'm sorry that I haven't uploaded in a pretty long time, but uh, I've been working um, a summer job, well, more of a late summer job really, but I've been working and things have gotten a bit crazy, so sorry that I haven't uploaded in a ridiculous um, amount of time. <laughs> So today I'm going to be doing a video on the Tex Arcana Moonlight Murders, um, which is a very interesting case, and I had, um, it was very interesting to sort of dig into it and learn all the details and stuff, um, but I would like to say first that, um, there, this case is pretty graphic, so if, like, blood, gore, um, sexual assault, that kind of thing. If that, like, doesn't sit well with you, then this might not be the video for you. Also, if you hear any background noise or anything, um, my family is home, so you might hear, like, the dog snoring or my dad watching TV or something. Well, now that we've gotten all that out of the way, let's get into the case. So, the town where these murders took place is called Texarkana, which it's called that because it is right in the middle of the borders between Arkansas and Texas. The first attack took place on the 22nd of February in 1946. Jimmy Hollis, who was 25, and Mary Jean Larry, who was 19, went on a date to the movies and afterwards they went to a local lover's lane. After a few minutes at this lover's lane, there was a bright flashlight that was shown into their car. They heard a man's voice say something along the lines of, I don't want to kill you, fellow, so you better do what I say. The man then commanded Jimmy to get out of the car, and so obviously they both got out of the car. The man told, also told Jimmy to take his pants off, and after he did so, the man started beating and stomping him. He beat Jimmy so bad that his skull cracked. And Mary Jean said that the sound of Jimmy's skull cracking was so loud that she thought at first that it was a gunshot. Mary Jean then told the man that they didn't have any money, but after she did so, the man threw her to the ground. When she got up, he told her to run, but she was wearing heels and he ran after her after she ran off and he easily catched up to her. He hit her again, which caused her to fall, and then he started abusing her. Jimmy miraculously woke up, even though he had his skull cracked, and was able to stop a passing car. When the attacker saw the headlights of the car, he ran off. Both of them survived the attack, but Jimmy was actually in the hospital for 12 days after having his skull cracked. Mary Jean said to the police that the attacker was an African-American man who was wearing a white mask, which was made out of a sack with holes for the eyes and mouth. But Jimmy said he didn't remember much, but said that he thought that the attacker was a white man. Now, since the town of Texarkana at the time was a not really super safe place to live, the police didn't really take this t attack into too much consideration. Um, apparently this kind of thing wasn't exactly out of the ordinary at the time. Um, and while, of course, people were concerned about Mary Jean and Jimmy, they didn't really do much about it because this kind of thing was normal there. However, things started to take another turn a month later on March the 24th as there was another attack at a lover's lane near Texarkana. Richard Griffin, who was 29, and Polly Ann Moore, who was 17, were found deceased with bullet wounds in the back of their heads. They were last seen around 10 p.m. that night as they were having dinner with Richard's sister. They were found in a 1941 Oldsmobile. Richard was between the two front seats. He was on his knees and his head was in his hands. Also, weirdly enough, his pockets were turned inside out, making it look like maybe this was a robbery. Polly Ann was found lying in the back seat, face down, but there was evidence suggesting she had been killed outside of the car on a blanket and put inside the back seat afterwards. Paul Martin, who was 16, picked up his girlfriend, Betty Jo Booker, who was 15, after a dance that evening, as Mary Jo was in the band that was playing at that dance. The next morning, Paul's body was found. He had been shot four times. A search party was sent out to find Betty Jo, and they eventually found her in the woods, about a mile away from where Paul was. She'd been shot in the head and the heart, and she'd also been raped. 
Paul and Betty were both shot with a 32 caliber. The same kind of weapon that was possibly used in Richard and Polly Ann's murder. While the term serial killer wasn't even a thing in the 40s, the police were pretty sure that the people that murdered, or the person that murdered Betty Jo and Paul were the same people who had murdered Richard and Polly Ann, and possibly even the attack mentioned previously where the victims actually survived. They started an investigation that included both the Texas Rangers and the FBI. Hundreds of tips came through, and dozens of people were questioned, but police just couldn't seem to find anything. On the evening of the 3rd of May, Virgil Starks, who was 37, was sitting in his living room, when all of a sudden, someone shot at him through his front porch window. He was shot twice in the head, and died almost instantly. Virgil's wife, Katie, ran to help him, and she was also shot twice in the face, losing a few of her teeth, but she survived. She ran to the bedroom while the attacker tried to get into the kitchen window. Katie ran through the front door with a bullet lodged under her tongue. She was covered in blood, but she ran to her neighbor's house where they called the police, and she was taken to the hospital. When the police showed up at the Starks' house, the murderer was gone, but this time he left behind evidence. The police found bloody footsteps left by the killer that went from the house to the highway but no further. They also found be left behind a red and black flashlight. The Texarkana Gazette printed out a photo of it in color, which was unusual in the 40s, hoping that someone would recognize it or claim it, but no one did. At this point, the residents of Texarkana were terrified that a murderer was on the loose. And while the town wasn't exactly a safe place to live at the time, they'd never had a serial killer lurking through the streets. So they were positively terrified. I know I've used that word twice, but that's the best word I can describe it. They, they began using what I can only describe as home alone methods of protecting themselves. Front and back doors would be rigged with either pots or pans filled with loose nails or silverware, so if someone opened the door, not only would they be rained down by nails or silverware, but their presence would be easily made known. There was also an increase in sales of shotguns and watchdogs, and stores began running out of curtains and blinds. According to investigator Tillman Johnson, quote, people would stand out near the front of their homes and yell at you to identify yourself before you got too close. You had to identify yourself or you would get shot. The murder of Virgil Starks was the last murder of the supposed phantom killer, which is what the killer was eventually dubbed. However, many people think that the murder of Virgil Starks isn't connected to the other murders and attacks. The general circumstances of the attack is different. For instance, the first few were on young people in lovers' lanes, whereas this one was on a married couple in their home. And also, a different gun was used. The gun used to attack the Starkses was a 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol, not a 32 caliber. So let's get into the theories of who the killer might be. The first theory is that the killer was a college student named H.B. Duty Tennyson, who admitted to some of the murders in a suicide note left after he killed himself. The murders that he had confessed to in this note were those of Betty Jo and Paul, and also that of Virgil Starks. According to Duty's cousin, a man named Dr. John Tennyson, Duty had connections to all of the victims of the killer. He allegedly was an usher at the theater that some of the victims frequented. He was in the same band that Betty Jo was in, and his friend actually lived in the same house as Katie Starks' sister. But, there is a but. This is all just things that this man said, and we can't prove it to be true or not. So this is technically all just hearsay and might not be true. And now we get into the second theory, which, in my opinion, is slightly more plausible than the other. An Arkansas trooper named Max Tackett noticed that 
cars were reported missing and later found abandoned around the same time when the killer would strike. Police decided to follow this lead and held a stakeout on the 28th of June, 1946, in a downtown parking lot in Texarkana, where they arrested Peggy Swinney, the wife of a man named Uel Swinney. While she was in custody, Peggy gave detailed descriptions of how UL had killed Betty Jo and Paul. However, the details of her involvement varied. In the first version of this story, Peggy said that on April the 13th, the day before Betty Jo and Paul were found dead, she and UL parked their car at Spring Lake Park and had some beers to drink. She claimed that UL left the car because he had to pee, as you do, but he was gone for an hour. She said she heard something that sounded like two gunshots. It was already morning when he returned, and he and Peggy sped off at full speed. Peggy claimed that his clothes were wet, too. Now, Spring Lake Park, where they were murdered, is actually close to a lake. So, it's possible, in, if we're going with this theory, that UL had well, gone into the lake to wash the blood off him. However, the very next day after she gave this statement, July the 24th of 1946, she gave a different story in which she was far more involved in the murders. She claimed that on April the 13th, Uel told her that he was going to rob someone at Spring Lake Park. Peggy decided to join him, where he took her to Paul Martin's car. Uel pulled a gun on them and told them to get out of the vehicle. Peggy refused to search Betty Jo and Paul, for money, which angered Uel. He shot Paul twice because of the fact that he was angry. She then claimed that she held down Betty Jo while Uel got his car. Both girls got into the car, and Uel shot Paul twice again while he was in the car, as apparently Paul was still alive after being shot twice already. He took Betty Jo into the woods while Peggy stayed in the car. He apparently told Peggy that he had tried to have sex with Betty, but when Betty refused, he shot and killed her. However, despite the two different stories, Peggy actually gave some information that only the police officers would have known. Peggy said that Paul's date book had been thrown into some bushes, a detail that only someone at the scene of the crime would have known. Uel was arrested. He was not as willing to talk as his wife was. While she had given her statements to police, she couldn't testify against Uel in court because they had only been married a few hours before she was arrested. Peggy ended up getting arrested for helping Uel stealing the car, but she was released while Uel got life in prison for being a habitual criminal but he was released also in 1973 on parole. It was never proven that either UL or Duty were the killers, because unfortunately they didn't really have any concrete evidence on either of them. So technically either of them could be the killers, although personally I do have to lean towards the UL theory more just because of the things that Peggy said about the notebook and of how Paul was shot four times and how she, Betty Jo was found in the woods, it all matched up really well. And even though Duty did have some connections to the, bur the murder victims, there wasn't a whole lot of concrete evidence that he'd actually done it. Although it does make you wonder why he would confess to the murders if he didn't actually do them, especially in a suicide note. I don't know, this case is really, really weird, and there are so many loose ends that just don't go together at all. That's all I can really comment about. Like, it- nothing really makes sense. It also makes me wonder whether or not the last murder, the murder of Virgil Starks, was connected to the other one. Because, like I said before, the circumstances surrounding his murder were very different than the ones earlier. But again, I don't really know. I wasn't there and it was such a long time ago, so I don't know. A movie was actually made about this case and it was called This Town That Dreaded Sundown, which is a very accurate name. Um, I've never watched the movie, but um, I actually might after researching this case. 
So unfortunately, the killer of this case was never really found. They don't, I mean, all we have are those two theories and neither of them are really completely concrete. While Peggy's story did match up with the scene of the crime of, with the scene of the crime of the murder of Paul and Betty Jo, it could just be a coincidence. She could have just guessed it, or maybe her and Yuel happened upon the bodies while they were in the lover's lane and freaked out and just left. You never really know. The town of Texarkana still talks about the, the murders to this day, and I can't imagine living there, wondering if maybe the killer is still alive. He could be one of the nursing homes, or just an, your regular elderly man, or woman, just walking down the street every day, and you would never know. It's honestly quite unsettling. Although, some people believe that maybe the killer moved out of the area after the last murder. It's kind of interesting to think about, but also pretty scary. <laughs> but anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up because it really helps me out. Um, if you enjoyed this video, then you should check out some of my other videos. And if you like my content in general, then subscribe. And if you don't, then that's fine. There's no pressure here. <laughs> um, I'll hopefully see you in the next video. See you later. Oh, and also, if you have any case recommendations, be sure to leave them in the comments below. Um, I would definitely love to look into maybe some murders I haven't heard about, or just, like, interesting true crime stories, maybe a couple missing persons cases. Leave them all down below, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!